Pick your lazy ass up. <laughs> So this guy's Fuck out of here. Guilty pleasures. We all got them. Whether it's a TV show that you love to watch into the late hours of the night despite knowing it's pure garbage, music from your youth that your brain just won't let go of, or even a nice cold glass of Bobby, I love fuck. You have a You we all have our own guilty pleasures. But a medium that allows for more guilty pleasures than any other is Gamey Gamer Games for Gamers, of the game variety. Go up to anyone you know that's into these video games and they'll have at least one guilty pleasure to tell you about. Uh, my guilty pleasure game is the 3DS version of Sonic Generations. Uh, because it had Radical Highway in it and I really liked that level by... I play a huge amount of Cookie Clicker. I think I wasted like hundreds and hundreds of hours on that game just looking at a funny number go up. Guilty pleasure game is the great Gianna sisters on uh, Commodore 64 and it got a bajillion sequels. Gianna sisters too. Uh, so, whether for fun or some other unhinged reason, I'm going to be going over a few games that, despite their many, many, many flaws, somehow manage to tickle the part of my brain that feeds me spoonfuls of dopamine. And you can proceed to rightfully refer to me as the lobotomized single-digit IQ jester that I am. Without any further ado, let's get into it. Skip it up and up. You know what I despise? Ubisoft titles. The traits infested within these games are infuriating, putrid, and even stinky. Skill trees, watchtowers, overly large, lifeless maps for the sake of marketing gimmicks to put on the back of the box, an ungodly amount of tedious and painfully boring side quests that exist solely to pad out the completionist playtime, stories that while on the surface seem like they want to make a point about something, whether it be political or a more general statement on the human condition, in actuality are just as cookie cutter and paper thin as any of the shitty side quests. A monetization plan and business model that does nothing but continue to damage the video game industry as a whole, and the worst Worst thing of all, being painfully unfunny. We should come up with a meme really quick. But I like Far Cry. The Far Cry series is a pretty bizarre one, especially when looked at as a whole. The first game was a shitty overglorified tech demo that nobody remembers. It gets a sequel that's completely different and unrelated, but is really solid in its own right and helps to set out the groundwork for modern AAA game structure. The third game is basically a streamlined and de-edged version of the second one, but achieves far more success because of it. Then that game is made again, but slightly worse. Then that game is made again, but a little bit more fun, but that's only because it was way buggier and goofier, so not through any actual improvement of the formula. Then that game is made again, but worse, and with Breaking Bad Man. Oh yeah, and Blood Dragon, some of the bullshit came out too. I don't know what it is about these games, but despite them containing every single issue that I mentioned about Ubisoft series, even being the place where some of them got their start, I swear Far Cry 3 put AAA game development back by a decade, I still find myself returning to every new entry. Keep in mind that I cannot stand Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, or any of the other annual Ubisoft series, but for some reason I like these ones. I think it's the sandbox. Unlike something like Watch Dogs, where you're given all the different play things, but a gameplay loop that allows for about as much experimentation as a conservative Christian bedroom, 3 Sandbox actually lets you mess around with the stuff you were given. It was more open-ended, with capturing bases and fighting enemies feeling fun and rewarding, even if it had a tendency to get repetitive after a while. And since then, despite there being addition after addition to the games, no attempt has been made to change the original skeleton to accommodate these additions, resulting in games that are horribly unbalanced, buggy, ridiculous, and a shit ton of fun. Take the enemy AI, for example, who it seems with every game get closer in intelligence to an otter with brain rot than an actual trained mercenary. When in reality, these are the same mercs as Far Cry 3, but because there's so much more shit going on, like RPG elements, new vehicles they can drive, and new types of enemies they need to interact with while battling you, they all just end up shitting themselves and running around like headless chickens. Bring the bag to Dr. Charles. That should be easy enough. What the fuck? What, what is he doing? Why is he running away from me? Let me- I just want to give you a bag. <gasps> I'm sorry, what? Why is he driving? Can you help me? I've got the list of stuff I still need. If you could find them, we may actually have a chance. It's Good Lord, what now? Visuals on target. Help me! Someone, please! Uh, Finally, you calm down, you Jesus. The deputy. The one Dutch has been talking about, yeah? Sorry, my name's Charles. Everyone calls me Doc, but I'm not... I'm not that kind of doctor. No. I need help, please!
So while this might not result in a realistic, challenging battleground simulator, what it does result in is some of the goofiest shit you'll ever see in a single player AAA game. My personal favourite for the series is probably 5. To me, it has the most unique setting and the best blend of chaotic bullshit along with having an ending I didn't actually see coming, which is more than I can say for any other Ubisoft game. Far Cry 6, while still being more of the same, took a nosedive in production quality for seemingly no reason seeing as the last game sold like fucking hotcakes. The cutscenes look nasty, the way characters interact with the world is far jankier, and even though having a mute protagonist in 5 got some backlash, I'll take a mute Sheriff any day over Danny, who is about as intriguing a character as a cardboard box. 6's story in general is just so bland, meaningless, and soul-suckingly boring, with the only highlight being the main villain cutscene starring Breaking Soul himself, and little Chuck. Chicanery. Literally, the game just cuts to these two when it feels like it, because they know it's the only thing story-wise people give a shit about. Despite that, it's still the same game as it's been for a while at the end of the day, and it's a big old guilty pleasure for me. I'd love to see an actual evolution of the Far Cry formula, not something stupid like tacked on RPG. <laughs> Not something stupid like tacked on RPG elements or third person for the hub area. But even if the game remains the same, I know I'll keep coming back. Well, when they're on sale. Super Mario Sunshine is my favourite Mario game of all time. It's also one of my favourite games in general. This is a bit of a funny one. It's one of those games where the public opinion has slowly shifted over time, and I didn't even realise it was happening until the last couple years. As far as I can remember, everybody regarded Sunshine as a great time, but if you look now, you'll see a bit of a different opinion. That being that Sunshine is the strange, jankier, less polished middle child between two greater siblings. And if you do insist on playing it, a 100% run should never be attempted. But I love Sunshine even going for the stomach churning 100%. Everything that people seem to hate about it now only comes off as endearing attempts to further the formula to me. I love how it sticks to one main theme for the levels, really going all the way with the idea of a holiday destination. It's got a visual style that I have yet to see replicated in another 3D Mario game. And as hated as the 3D All-Stars collection is, and for good reason, it further cemented that all this game really needs is an HD upscale to look just as modern as its initial release. It's so pretty. The island natives being new and unique characters was a great choice. No Goombas here. Join the Goombas! <laughs> they also sound funny. Fun is such a fun way to shake up the traditional Mario control scheme. It really feels natural when you think about it. This game is a follow-up to 64, and it manages to recontextualize certain aspects of 64's controls and give them more purpose. Looking around in the weird turret mode is actually utilized for things other than being abducted. The music is also fantastic, but you already knew that. I played 64 first as a kid, but even that game's music doesn't have the ability to evoke the feelings of being at home like Sunshine does. It's one of those games where even if I boot it up just to run around in the hub world for a bit, I'm still having fun. 64, Galaxy, Odyssey, when I boot these up, I immediately start heading towards my next goal. I got shit to collect. But in Sunshine, I tend to just walk around, taking in the environment and listening to the tunes, despite the fact that I've been looking at these environments since I was like nine, and I know they're not gonna be any different this time around. Oh, but the blue coin! The blue coin! <laughs> You know this game is a 3D collect-a-thumb platformer, right? That's the goal of every single mission, is to get a shiny thing? Oh, but they're so hard to find! If you didn't have the internet, you could never find them all! Yeah, god forbid a game has secretive, hard-to-find items that you need to rack your mind or even reach out to other sources to find. Every time those are in a game, they're nothing but frowned upon. Even the blue coins are enjoyable to me to a certain extent. While I think there's definitely too many of them, causing them to really wear out their welcome by the end, I like having to consult something like a strategy guide or an online guide to help me find them. It makes them feel like a hunt for pirate treasure or something. It once again evokes a childhood feeling of thinking a game that you're playing is just endless. But I realize no one else shares that view. And even though not every new thing that it tried was exactly a home run, certain infamous sections like the pachinko game and the lily pad ride are proof enough of that, I still like that the game was willing to try anything in the name of a new experience. The postcard can eat my toenails though. Rayman is fucking cool. Rayman 2 The Great Escape is another one of my favourite games of all time. I remember playing the PS1 port on my brother's old PS1 before I had any other game console to call my own, and it's retained a place in my heart ever since. Rayman 3 is one of the first games I ever bought for myself. It was an absolute blast. Even if playing it now, some of the humour makes me So you think with all that in mind, I'd hate these guys. 
The Rabbids, often referred to as the Minions before the Minions, were the French schizo bunnies that for a time wrecked the Rayman series. With their minigame collections becoming so popular that after a third one, Rayman didn't even bother to come into work anymore. He didn't even hand in a two weeks notice. Now while the current incarnation of these guys definitely have parallels to their yellow spiritual successors, I still attest that the original version of the Rabbids were a great time capsule of the late 2000s. They were gross, morbid, weirdly edgy at certain points, and didn't seem like something that had become so popular they would overshadow the unofficial mascot of the company that made them. Rayman Raving Rabbids is the first in the RCU and is an incredibly charming game. Something I'm actually a little bit ashamed to admit is the first Rayman Raving Rabbids game is the game I have completed 100% the most out of any other in my life. It's a yearly ritual at this point. It's also the game I own the most versions of. All I'm missing is the 360 port and the GBA game that's a 2D side scroller and follows the plot of the original scrapped beat em up concept for the game. Soon you'll be mine. <laughs> Something about how weird of a follow-up this is to Hoodlum Havoc, how outside of the Glowbox babies all the characters are completely new, and the weird grotesque nature of the game's sense of humour, make it seem like some fan game or a weird concept the dev team liked that would never actually get put into production with a budget. The minigames themselves are mostly quite good, there's a few standout ones like the DDR ripoff, the drawing one, the milking game, and the on-rail shooting sections which are basically a game in of themselves with how fleshed out they are compared to the rest of the minigames, with their own overarching plot and getting surprisingly creepy and atmospheric near the end. If you're playing the Wii version, there's definitely a couple minigames that just don't work as well thanks to the very nature of them being an early Wii title. This one is fucking horrible. But while I love the original game, unfortunately all the things I loved about it were slowly ironed out in the sequels. In the second game, the Rabbids are just in the real world now, and so is Rayman, so they're just they're not in the Rayman world anymore, and the on-rail sections are just pre-recorded footage with rabbits slapped onto them, which is way lamer. The gross-out factor is tuned way down, and overall it's just not as fun as the first game. The third title, Rabbids TV Party, is definitely a step up. The concept of all these rabbits infecting Rayman's TV set and slowly driving him mad is a really funny one. There's a reason why screenshots from the cutscenes are always popping up on Twitter, and it lends itself well to the minigame format. Also, it's always going to be cosmically funny to me that this game ends with Rayman snapping into insanity and being ravaged by manic bunnies, and that was the last time he was seen in a game for years. And looking at how he acts in Origins and Legends, he never snapped out of it. The series then went fully rabid, with Rabbids Go Home, but that game could be an entire discussion in its own right, so we'll leave that one alone for now. Pokemon! Gen 1. I know, I've talked about my weird 8-brain enjoyment of the Pokemon games before, but I bet you didn't expect me to be so brain-dead that I still play these games. Pokemon Generation 1 has the least Pokemon of the entire series, the most basic map in the entire series, the most broken and archaic battle system of the entire series, and it's fucking hideous in every way from the overworld to the Pokemon themselves. And if you play the Japanese version, it's even buggier and even uglier. But I like it. So, uh, the great thing about this is you can play it with every other game I've gone over today, I can talk away and almost justify my enjoyment for every negative aspect of them. I can explain why Far Cry is fun to me despite its Ubisoft patented bullshit, I can explain my weird Stockholm Syndrome like of the Blue Coins and Sunshine, and I can even justify my enjoyment of a minigame collection from 2006 that led to the temporary death of one of my favourite video game franchises of all time, but I cannot for the life of me explain this one. I think it's just the, the simplicity? It has to be. No 5 to 20 hour long tutorials just to explain how to pick up the controller and use your thumbs without drooling. No painfully boring story, or at least not one that gets in the way of the game. No whatever this is, just simple, dumb fun. Walk around, catch Pokemos, and fight them. Catch a cycle attack and win the game instantly. I think I just like it when it's obvious that a game is being made by a small group of people that despite the odds managed to actually finish something and get it released. There's no team of dedicated artists modelling a backlog of Pokemon on to be used for years to come in an endless line of cookie cutter sequels, there's just a few dudes making crude doodles for a Game Boy. It's just bleeps and bloops made by a team of passionate people who fell in love with an idea. It's like when you go back to the first film in a huge franchise that's now entrenched in pop culture, and you can see the budget on the screen. How something as simple as a group of people with a camera and a shitty little synthesizer can turn into this. I didn't even play Gen 1 first, so it can't just be nostalgia, right? There's, there's, there's gotta be something that this game does right that the others don't even try. Right? Yeah, there is. It's gambling. Back with better time and thinking better like how many times do I have to come? Pave away for the pad list, follow for the game I save, I filled up cards. Here we go, here we go, here we go. First day he pauses game to be Um Okay, I keep getting lucky on this machine. 
with my coins. I'm going to show you the machine, but if that has anything to do with it, you can try. Pokemon Red version. Look at my, look at my coins. I'm going to try one more time. Wow. You see that? Subway Surfers. That's a, that's a game. Power Wash Simulator.